see a resident. I think it's Perrier, I see, is the drink. And uh, <laughs> Tia Guanyin tea for me. I'm a tea drinker, of course. And and uh, we'll we'll start with China, but first, welcome, Jeff, and, and uh, tell us what you do. Well, thank you, Stefan. It's good to be here. Hello, everyone. Uh, I am a lawyer here in Washington, D.C. And, and you you make the law interesting and you travel as much as you can. So we'll we'll uh, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll take that rigor of analysis and, and jump right into China. So you do a lot of business in China as well as other countries. I've I've seen your card with the English on the front, Chinese on the back. So you, you've gone there enough to to make it worthwhile printing those cards. So what's it like for uh, we've got a lot of EPS members that are interested in travel and would almost make their career fit fit travel if it can. So people that are interested in an international business career, you've been in finance, law, deal making, all kinds of things. How do you get started out? You're in your 20s and want an international business career. You, you have to work very hard. Of it. Um, so when you're in law school, there's one mantra that they among others that they, they bit into your, your head. It's the law is a jealous mistress. You think about mm. that, the law is a jealous mistress, which means that practicing law, which is which I'm sure is true for other professions, is very time consuming. Uh, so at the expense of many other things in life. Uh, and that certainly is the case, I think, with any any learned profession that, that you're devoted to, it takes a lot of time. So in my 20s, Stefan, I didn't travel that much. I worked and I studied and I worked. Um, over time, uh, I developed opportunities uh, to do uh, work in, in different parts of the world, primarily by, based on U.S. business interests there. And I have a natural passion for travel and a natural curiosity about other countries and a natural um, uh, sense of adventure when it, when it, comes, when it, when it comes to new, uh, new opportunities of that nature. So started with one, became two, became three. And over time, it, it, it just evolves. It, it, it evolves based on relationships, it ba based on uh, based on relationships, and 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 based on um, uh, other other real business and personal. China, I won't say that I'm a China expert. I have worked in China, uh, mostly representing U.S. interests there, uh, as well as uh, some Chinese interests. Uh, we have three offices in China, in Beijing, Shanghai, and Hong Kong, which gives me a good base uh, when, when I conduct business there. Um, sometimes it's uh, not for the faint of heart. Uh, mm -hmm. I would say that, I would say that the, the the business the business card is really focused on my activity there, not here in the United States. Uh, I think if uh, someone was greeting you to conduct business in the United States from Finland and you receive mm -hmm. a business card in Finnish. And not a new mm -hmm. gen finish that that's a that's that's a barrier a further barrier to entry that you can easily remedy uh, which i attempt to do so along with uh, the team that i work with in different parts of the world a lot of business travelers especially american ones seem to want nothing to do with travel beyond the business travel but i know i know tibet is a favorite of yours i know Chengdu is a favorite city so for those travelers that they've maybe been to China, they've been on that Beijing, Shanghai, Xi'an, maybe maybe Guilin, that first group tour. Tell us about Chengdu, why you love it, and tell us about a Tibet trip. Well, it, it it's all experiencing, um, it's like any country, it's a very diverse country. Uh, Chengdu is a very hot, you think of Chezuan and, and Chezuan food, it's very spicy, mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's a very, it's a probably more laid back culture than uh, the coast, coastal cities of China. Uh, but it's, it's a beautiful city. Uh, they have, uh, for those of you who have family and children, they have a panda reserve, uh, which is right outside of the city and, and a lot of fun. It's also close to Lhasa, which is the capital of Tibet. Uh, you can fly from Chengdu or anywhere in China to Lhasa. And, and Tibet is a unique culture unto itself. The Tibetan people are, are warm and welcoming and have a very rich history. Fantastic, and I, I know another one you like is, is Harbin, which which some may have heard of from the the Winter Ice Festival. So tell us about that city. Old industrial city, uh, north uh, in, in in north uh, north of Beijing, closer to Russia and North Korea. Uh, north Korea. It's uh, again couldn't be more different than Chengdu. 
both in terms mm -hmm. of geography and feel, and even even the food. So the food, uh, there, there was a lot of cross pollination over the years between Russia and in that part of China. So the the food and some of the architecture are are Russian. Um, they love ice cream, uh, morozhna, I believe is. Uh, even know the Russian word for ice cream, uh, but more exotic, they have a Siberian tiger uh, mm -hmm. refuge outside of the city where you can uh, get up very close and personal to large mm -hmm. car carnivorous tigers. Uh, wow, that's fantastic. <laughs> you, could, yeah, you could actually, they, there's a part of observing uh, the, the tigers in captivity, they essentially put you in a, um, a flatbed truck uh, with a wow. cage, and you're surrounded by a cage, and the tigers will greet you when uh, you greet them with uh, uh, a piece of meat on a stick that uh, that they provide you with. Uh, it would never happen here in the United States, you know. Too much yeah. ability. Oh, yeah. uh, and at the end, you uh, there are exotic. Uh, I mean, they're they're white tigers, and it's just a, an another worldly place. Wow, and I'm, I'm thinking Harbin is. About the only place in China where you'll see uh, pumpernickel bread on, the, <laughs> even in some of the markets, mentioning that that Russian influence. Uh, it, it, you won't you won't find pumpernickel bread on the streets in, in Chengdu, that's for sure. <laughs> let's 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 zoom around the world. I know last year you were in Saudi Arabia, and that country has been starting to open to tourists. Uh, uh, people are very curious. There's there's a lot of mystery and, and mystique as, as well as, of course, religious pilgrimage sites. Uh, it sounds like there's dive opportunities. There's there's a lot happening. So tell us about the, in, in a way you get more access as a business visitor. So tell us about it. Well, they're, they're opening up for tourism as well. Very welcoming culture. Uh, very curious about us as we're curious about them. Uh, very safe place uh, has been mm -hmm. my experience. Um, and and uh, lots of business opportunities. Uh, based on on my observation, they're opening uh, uh, under the current leadership of MBS. I believe they're opening the country to to tourism worldwide. Um, mm -hmm. The the Jeddah, the coastal cities. Those of you who have been to different parts of the the Gulf region or the Middle East know that the you know the beaches are absolutely gorgeous. Um, and and uh, if you're a scuba diver like I am, can be a a destination you really want to pursue. Uh, I think uh, I think the current leadership in Saudi Arabia has the same vision uh, for coastal Saudi Arabia as well as other parts of the country. Uh, there are there are parts of the country that um, uh, th that have antiquities that have not been uh, properly traveled by non Saudis that they're opening up, um, and and I believe that Bocelli performed at one such site a couple of years ago, which started the the push. Or was around the timeline of the push to open the country uh, to more outside tourists uh, started. Oh, well, fantastic! And, and you mentioned diving, so I, I I don't scuba dive. I want to. Uh, I have an equalization problem in the past 10, 15 years that I haven't been able to solve. We so can I, 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 hmm? we can work on that. I, I I certainly should because I've been to a lot of the most famous sites in the world and all I've done has been paddling around on the surface. So let, let's run through some of the highlights that you've experienced as, as well as the ones that are the dream spots that you haven't yet reached. Well, um, I, I have both my children and I scuba, scuba dive and you know, we've been to a number of places around the world. Uh, highlights would include in, in near North America, uh, Cayman Islands um, and, and uh, Caribbean coastal Central America. Uh, that, that that would be great if you haven't experienced came in great great diving. Uh, Dahab in Egypt and Egypt is one of my all time favorite destinations um, is 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 incredible. Uh, they have a blue, we've heard about the blue hole in Belize, mm. uh, which is world famous as a blue hole in Dahab. Mm. And uh, I didn't. Uh, I, I didn't complete the blue hole. I went in the blue hole. I circumnavigated the blue hole, but I didn't. I think it's over two hundred feet. 250 feet down and there's a little archway at the end that you you can get out and come all the way up but as you approach to uh, enter the water for the blue hole uh, it's a shore dive it's, it's right you don't have to take a boat uh, okay th there's a there's a plaque as you walk to the point in which you dive off and on the plaque are names of, of of people who attempted to dive the blue hole to completion and who didn't make it uh, oh, so goodness. 
so life is life is a little too precious. So I decided to, uh, I decided to um, in, enjoy it, but not to not not to risk life and limb. I'm not and, a and someone like me that really has no concept. It's it's the depth, it's the conditions, it's visibility, it's what 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 factors into making it so risky. It's the depth. It's it's the depth. It's it's a, it's a very deep dive. Um, it, the deeper you go, the more the more oxygen you consume and uh, the risk of nitrosis, nitrosis when nitrogen gets in your blood uh, increases, which can kill you. Mm -hmm. uh, it makes you actually feel a little tipsy if you're getting a little bit too much nitrogen. So a lot of people lose track if they're not trained or they're not with a dive master. I was with a dive master and I, I could have attempted the blue hole. It was my decision not to. Uh, I, I did in terms of going all the way down to the bottom all the way up, but we did circumnavigate the blue hole as well as going in the blue hole. And I don't know if this is true, but I'll tell you what, what was shared with me. So as we circumnavigated the blue hole, I saw this pie shaped cut uh, in the middle of this perfect geological <laughs> cylinder. Mm -hmm. And it, it looked, it was too angular to be natural. So when we got to the surface, I asked him what that was. Uh, and he's, according to this dive master, again, don't know if it's true. Uh, he said that Jacques Cousteau, if you, if you remember that name, he used to have a television show. He's a scuba diver exploring marine life around the world. I watched him when I was a young boy. Um, was was at in Dahab with his boat, uh, which named Calypso. That name means a bell to anyone. And he wanted he wanted to park Calypso in the middle of the of the blue hole, but it, but it was too uh, it was too shallow for him to go over the the reef. So he asked a couple of his uh, folks to to blow a hole. <laughs> In, in, uh, on the rim, so his so Calypso could shimmy into the top of the blue hole. But uh, I don't know. Oh, if that, that that hurts the image a little bit. But that's oh, it's, a the, it's a different era. It's a different era. It is a different era, absolutely. And and so then uh, I think shark diving as well. Uh, yes, I family and the the family and the uh, in the cage together <laughs> dives together. Or no, I mean, Right, so I, uh, I've done a, a few shark dives, uh, two of the most notable ones, I did cage diving uh, off the coast of uh, South Africa uh, it, uh, near, near an area called Seal Island. Seal Island, great whites eat seals. So this is their cafeteria, essentially. Mm. And there's established uh, cage diving tour um, that, that uh, was a family affair uh, with my, my, my children, both of whom are scuba divers. So, um, uh, it was really real. Uh, I, I grew up with Jaws. Uh, I grew up on the on, on coastal New England, so I went to the beach, and sw an avid swimmer. And when Jaws came out, it terrified me. So I had this fascination with great whites. And Peter Benchley, who wrote Jaws, I remember reading his book in a day and a half. Uh, of, you know, as a kid, it was like 300, 400 pages. Uh, the book was actually better than the movie in some respects because you of course, using your imagination. So I was determined to uh, to, to to meet my uh, bet noir, um, mm -hmm. which I did, and my children enjoyed it very much. And I, I, as much as we have Facebook and digital gaming and, and everything the kids are into today, uh, that's coming out of eye with a multi-ton carnivore, uh, <laughs> real. <laughs> And it's something that's going to be uh, displaced or supplanted by technology. I also went shark diving uh, off the coast of uh, Honduras on Roatan. That was not with a cage. It was school of uh, blue sharks. Um, and when, if those of you who scuba dive, um, special instructions that you put your your hand under your armpit and you uh, armpits because you don't want them waving around like a fish. And okay. we, yeah, and we all. Um, Descended to the shore, to the floor of the floor of the ocean, and the dive master had a canister of goodies for the sharks that he released at a distance with a string, and it produced this tornado of uh, of activity, where whereby you, this water was really crystal clear blue, and and while the sharks the sharks were in a feeding frenzy, you couldn't see a foot in front of you. It was just an amazing sight to to behold. Wow. Now, do you travel with any of your own equipment or do you rent everything when you're there? I don't travel with my own equipment. I, I do rent everything uh, when, when, I, um, when, when, I, when I dive. By I'm curious about uh, uh, wreck diving. Have you, have you done any wreck diving? I, I have. I have. 
Um, my son and I just got back from uh, Key West, actually, uh, mm. in February, right before this whole COVID uh, pandemic uh, started. You know, it was, in retrospect, it was serendipitous that we had a, a brief respite before we're sheltering in place uh, indefinitely. Um, and there is there's a there's a wreck off the, the coast of Key West, which is an old military ship that was intentionally put there uh, as an artificial reef, but it's also a very popular diving site. I've also done wreck diving throughout the Caribbean and and in the Mediterranean uh, in the Red Sea. I've been fascinated by uh, Micronesia and, and Chuk, uh, the the World War II wrecks. I've heard that's that's like the the spot for World War II wrecks. So if I'm if I'm going to overcome my equalization issue and start diving, that that's my number one target. And I remember people waiting for boarding those flights in Palau and that talking about how this was like the the trip of a lifetime for them. And here I'm like, oh, I'm just going for two days to walk around, but you know these places and. And they thought I was as alien to me as, as, as they were to them. <laughs> it's on my list. I think I think those of you who travel who haven't tried scuba diving, um, I, I recommend it. It, 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 it. Just as travel transports you into a different world, into a different mm -hmm. environment, into a different culture, uh, I have found that scuba diving is it, it does the same in, in, in many similar respects. And I found it very relaxing, very zen. And you mentioned your children traveling with you quite a bit, and I, I don't have children. I've always thought that I could uh, just convince my wife wherever I wanted to take the kids would be that, oh, well, there's kids there, but it's it, it, it's, it's maybe not so simple, yet you've, you've taken them, what, I think it was over 50 countries uh, by the time uh, your one child was 17. So t talk about how you how you swing that as a parent, school, school season, you know, school uh, well, vacation. We don't disrupt school, so uh, rarely do, maybe a couple of days around spring break, but almost never disrupt school. But I, I, travel is a passion, and uh, I subscribe to the notion that you don't spoil children through experiences. Um, hmm. I, think wow. it's, I think it's educational, I think it's enriching, and it's something I love to do. Uh, so it's something that we could all enjoy together, among other things, but travel was a big part of her life. So many, uh, almost every vacation that we had together, we'd at least have one annual trip that's dedicated solely to new travel. And mm -hmm. In terms of cost, um, that, that's always a factor. And when I was a child, my parents used to take me to Disney World. Um, it was pretty new back then. Um, and I've taken my children to Disney World and I love Disney World, but it's, it's, not, it's not inexpensive. Uh, but if you look at the cost of a of a trip to Disney World uh, compared to say going to the Galapagos, they're comparable, it, it, um, not to the exclusion of Disney World, uh, but in addition to. So, based on the economics, it made sense. Uh, you mentioned uh, my my son. So, the, the story behind that, Stefan, is that when my son, both my children are grown, but when my son was applying to college. I, I, I peered at his uh, essay, which I shouldn't have, but, um, just to see what he's doing. And he mentioned something, a reference in his essay about having been touched by experiences in 50 countries. Uh, and I sort of called him out on that. And I said, I mean, you haven't been to 50 countries. And I don't know why you're even referencing it, right? Um, mm -hmm. uh, and he said, yes, I have, Dad. Uh, and let's get out the map. And, and we got out the map. and. Uh, we counted them, and it was actually it was actually wrong. It wasn't fifty; it was fifty-one. So, um, what how that enriches their life long term, and shapes what they want to do in this world, or their their perceptions of the world, uh, and their educational interests. It's too soon to tell. Uh, they're mm -hmm. still relatively young, uh, but it's something that that I enjoy doing. And um, I have photos uh, of us in many parts of the world uh, that I've that I've collected during our travels. And one of the things I, for those of you who travel with family and loved ones or, or friends, one of the things that, that I found uh, fun to do is that I kept all the digital photos. We started traveling really pre-digital when they're very, very young and I digitized mm -hmm. those. And are you familiar with the screensavers you've seen at the at offices of people's family photos? Well, Apple, sure. so Apple TV uh, made a device um, 
called Apple Apple made Apple TV, which is a device that had multiple features. But I purchased it for its ability to hold digital photos, and the app at the time that it could hold uh, up to thirty thousand digital photos, and I I have about twenty five thousand on mine now, and wow. I I connected it to a forty two inch flat screen TV uh, that is permanently on and it rotates the photos randomly every two seconds. So we have we have photos of all of our travels um, as a family and mostly of my children. I don't photo. I'm not very photogenic, um, uh, but I, I would say for those who of you have children, um, it, it, when, when teenage years come and they're distracted by multiple things and they have that natural impulse for independence, which I totally can understand and relate to. It's healthy. Uh, even even in their teen years, they would pause every now and then and look at that screen because one moment it could be two years old um, in Massachusetts, and then seventeen, then then twelve years old at the Beijing Olympics, and then sixteen years old uh, in in South Africa. Uh, it was it, it was it was a wonderful device to uh, refresh and renew memories. I think they have a sneaking suspicion, even as teenagers, that their father is cooler than they are. <laughs> With all these trips and the sharks. <laughs> well, we've done we've done our fair amount of trips, and uh, one of my favorite stories with my children is when we were safari um, in in South Africa. So, if, for those of you who've been in safari, it's a wonderful, wonderful uh, vacation. I mean, it's it's real. It's just it's expensive, but it's worth it. Um, mm -hmm. and we, and we went on a, a holiday. Uh, in in uh, on safari, and we went to this teeny tiny airport in in South Africa. And the way it works is that you land, you get into a van, and they drive you out to the game preserve. You actually live in these little these these little cottages, no fences. So you're right in the middle of wildlife, and you don't go out at night because you might get eaten. Um, so we landed uh, at this tiny airport. It was so tiny it didn't even have uh, there was no airport building. There was just, little cottage and you put people's luggage out in front of the plane and you went to your van. So we landed, um, again, middle of nowhere, got in the van. And as we entered the van, uh, there, there's an elderly couple and a small, uh, a small boy with blonde hair, maybe uh, 11 years old. Mm -hmm. we walked to the back of the van and uh, embarked for our, for a safari lodge, which, which is about 40 minutes away. And then the little the little boy in the front of the van said to my son, my son's name is Hunter, said, "Hey Hunter, how are you doing?" And I looked at, and I, and this is in the middle of nowhere in, in South Africa. And my son, hey, good to see you, Jack. I'm doing fine. As it turns out, and this is a small world story. As it turns out, years before, um, I had a gra we had a graduation uh, ceremony in Boston. Uh, from one of my alma maters. And the parents, th those of us who were graduating who had children said, you know what, why don't we have a party for our children while we're all at our graduation party? So we, we pulled resources, we rented a room, got babysitters and the children hung out while we, uh, while, while we enjoyed the evening as well. Well, Jack is the son of one of my classmates. <laughs> and we have a couple, uh, Jack's grandparents who were taking their grandson on a safari, totally transformed the entire safari experience. Every, sure, yeah. every game run, every, I mean, it was just, it was just phenomenal, but it's a very small world. Yeah, and, and speaking, you also mentioned the Olympics and one of my travel what ifs is, uh, I was living in Beijing during the Olympics, but we were actually in New York, uh, getting my wife uh, ready for her MBA at Columbia and, I was in the, they then had a Staples in Times Square. And I, I still remember I was uh, picking up a heavy desk that I was, I didn't want to pay for the taxi. So how do I get it on the, the subway or bus to get her, her new desk up, up to Upper West Side? And I get a call from a Beijing number. And it's one of my former colleagues. He was then at Adidas. He said, Stefan, I hope you're in town. I've got opening ceremony tickets for you tonight. And I just, <laughs> I nearly broke down after the days of Ikea furniture and, and all of that. So I, I missed out. What what was it like? And and do you recommend the Olympic experience? Now we're talking about 2021 in Tokyo. 
Um, that was our first and only Olympics. And I have uh, friends uh, who have been to every Olympic game, winter and summer. It's a great experience if you can. It's a, uh, for us, it was, a, it was a diversity of experiences that, 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 um, that, that we endeavored to, toward. But the, the Beijing Olympics were, were incredible. The opening ceremony, we've all seen it on TV. Stefan, we tried to get tickets to the opening ceremony. They were exorbitant. Mm -hmm. So we didn't go, but we went to a bunch of games. Um, but the uh, but Beijing, I've never seen Beijing transform like that. Clear sky. I think the the government limited the traffic in the city, um, mm -hmm. and, and uh, we met up with friends who were also there from America uh, as well. So it was it was an incredible experience, and one and one that I think my children really enjoyed. Uh, one of the highlights of the experience, we had tickets to uh, swimming competition. Um, mm. the, the Olympic Park, it's called the Water Cube. Uh, in mm -hmm. Beijing, you've probably seen photo, pictures of it, very unique design, kind of right across from the bird's nest, the main stadium. But we were there for Michael Phelps' eighth win, eighth gold. Oh. <laughs> and, and I had uh, um, one, one of my friends uh, provided me, as you can see, I have a lot of hair. <laughs> and one of, my, <laughs> one of my friends provided me uh, a, a skull cap if you're familiar with that, uh, yeah, yeah. made in the American flag uh, pattern. Ah. And I was wearing that during uh, the, the Phelps competition. And Phelps- You should have tattooed it on your head and we could enjoy yeah. it to this day. That's right. <laughs> um, Phel Phelps is a, a native of the greater DC area of Baltimore. Ah, well, let's, let's, let's transition. You just mentioned the word Baltimore. It maybe is the butt of jokes and or international viewers only know it from uh, uh, the wire, perhaps, uh, but um, talk, talk about the city. National Aquarium is there. American Revolutionary history, all kinds of stuff. Uh, Star Spangled a Banner. Yeah. So Baltimore features prominently in American history. It's a wonderful city. Uh, very much, much, very diverse industry base. Uh, I'm in Washington, which um, is is distinct from Baltimore in terms of in terms of industrial mix. But Baltimore is rich in history. Very proud. Uh, very proud people from Baltimore who are, and the Ravens, you know, were uh -huh. were, were headed headed in the finals. So it's um, it's it's a city that that it's rich in American history, um, and also biotechnology innovation. Johns Hopkins University, a leading research university, which is also relevant during this time of uh, coronavirus, is based in Baltimore, um, and they and, and they have been. The van, at the vanguard of, of innovation in the medical field. So it's worth a visit. It's also worth visiting Washington, D.C., uh, which, which my friends from outside the United States I always view as uh, sort of a sleepy Brussels of the United States. Uh, but, it's an ex <laughs> but it's an exciting, uh, diverse, very diverse uh, tier one city uh, in the U.S., full of culture and extremely livable. Uh, the city is was designed by Pierre L'Enfant, a Frenchman, uh, in the hub and spoke method. I'm told that his inspiration was Oriol, which is where Versailles is based outside of Paris. The hub mm. and spoke method, um, it, it's beautiful urban pattern. I'm told it's, de it's designed to repel invading uh, enemies. You can put a cannon right in one of the, uh, the hubs and, and, and push back. Okay, yeah. But it, 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 so just word of warning, it doesn't facilitate 21st century traffic. Uh, so it's an elephant. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> now the city is extremely, extremely manageable, but but uh, lots of people have come to live here. And uh, there's the highest per capita of graduate degree holders, I believe, in the country. It goes neck and neck every year with Boston and San Francisco. It's a very educated, diverse population. Uh, wonderful, wonderful place to visit. Uh, as I mentioned to Stefan, uh, from from a tech industrial standpoint, uh, Amazon is located at second headquarters in the world, uh, right here in Washington, technically Arlington, Virginia, um, which we're all excited about and and hope that it, uh, it continues to develop our already established technology market. And we're having this meeting tonight over the internet, which is brought to you by. Uh, our folks here at the DOD in Washington. And um, for those of you who have flown into Washington Dulles Airport, if you ever go mostly off the airport grounds and the suburbs, 
you'll find large windowless buildings, which are data centers, it's cottage industry. And that's because I'm told that 80 to 90% of the world's internet traffic flows through that part of our country, uh, largely due to the DOD legacy. Oh, that's incredible. I mean, yeah, I've been, been through Dallas many times and never, never quite thought about it. Uh, there's also an, an annex of the Air and Space Museum out that way that I've not yet visited. I've heard is, highly is incredible. Recommended. Highly recommended. It's it's just an amazing facility. The one on the mall in DC is the is is, is standard bearer, but they they're at capacity and they expanded, and, it, and it's free. Uh, so they they expanded um, they they expanded the the museum uh, right by Dulles, and they have the SF seventy one. Um, I think they have one of the Apollo capsules. It's it's a very large, impressive museum. So if you're in if you if you land in Dallas, you have a layover. You don't want to journey out that far. It's a great place to kill a few hours. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, that's actually why I didn't visit on this trip. As I figured at some point I'll have the perfect layover, and it's it's free, but the parking is like fifteen or twenty bucks. So if you're if you're on the layover, it's just as easy to get dropped off and not have to. Not have to pay in a parking. Uh, Stefan, can I show you one of my one of my travel goals? Okay, absolutely. I don't know if you can see this. Uh, can, can you? Is that image? Can you see this image? The reflection. Not, yeah, it's not coming through. Is oh, sure. okay. Well, mm -hmm. it's. Um, how about this? Is that coming through? At I can all? See, uh, uh, it's a little off. Put it closer to your chest, I would say. See the, the image? Just a bit of a reflection, not not quite coming through all that well. All right. Well, sorry. I'm trying to think of a way to position it. Maybe high over your head and out of the light. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. We're struggling. So, <laughs> so to, you know, we're... it's a little game I play with my children. I play with my children. So it's a mountain. It, it, it's a it's a mountain range and a sunset. Okay. And I said, okay, where is this? And we have Mojave Desert and, and other guesses and uh, Chile. Uh, it's actually a sunset on Mars. And, ah, okay. <laughs> and it was taken uh, by one of our probes on Mars that was, that was designed and implemented at Goddard Space Center right here in Washington. Uh, it is a national treasure for us. It is. I attended an open house years ago. And they, they, they offer open house homes occasionally three to four years um and that's and we know cape canaveral and nasa uh mm -hmm. in florida that's the launch pad and great facility uh, a lot of the scientists are, are, are right here in dc it's actually mm -hmm. suburban maryland um and they're, they're, they're la launching the next version of the hubble telescope telescope but the the have you seen the movie the martian of course yeah so that that's actual science and a lot of the renderings uh, actually come from Goddard. And right at the time of the open house, they had a lot of these images. And that looks very familiar. Uh, it was featured in, it featured in Martian, uh, but it looks so real. It's, uh, sorry for the, the quality, but if you go to you know, nasa.gov, you can find these images and they're crystal clear. And uh, it's an amazing, it's amazing uh, treasure trove of, of photos. Uh, but I, I think it was thought provoking uh, for a lot of folks when we talk about travel, uh, to think beyond where we live on this planet. Mm. When you see it, when you look, when you, when you reflect upon a sunset, our sun setting yeah. a different planet over a different mountain range, um, it, it is, um, uh, intriguing. You have, you have a plan, you have the inside connection, how to get there. <laughs> I think we, well, those of us who love to travel, I don't think we're limited, uh, to this earth, except except in terms of technology and ability, so I think many of us would would travel beyond uh, beyond this planet if we could, and and uh, um, who knows what the future holds. But uh, certainly, have, have you put a deposit down for Virgin Galactic? Or? Not yet. That's just suborbital. Uh, this is that's exactly my reaction. It feels like yeah, but <laughs> I know. I would, it would be interesting. I mean, it's yeah, yeah. You can go, and that's. Uh, it definitely would be great, great. on it. But... <laughs> I remember the days of Star Trek for those of you who ever watched that, and and uh, I was a as a wee wee lad when Neil Armstrong walked on the moon. Um, and someone once said to me, "There's one name that people remember a thousand years from now, and that's Neil Armstrong." 
uh, mm. think about it. Uh, that that was formative, and I think our sense for exploration and learning uh, is is based on. Is, I think it's in our DNA, and my personal view is that many of us in the future will have the opportunity to visit places beyond this earth. Uh, hopefully, we'll see that during our lifetimes as, as well. Oh, fantastic. Well, so inspiring, and I'm trying to, I, I don't even know a follow-up question to ask. Everything, everything I was thinking was a bit... Uh, a bit mundane that way when you we were talking about moonscapes and, and and marscapes i was thinking bolivia is about the closest experience that i've had that that feels like that and as i understand nasa has tested things like mars rovers uh on the salt flats of, of bolivia for the climate and in that and that's maybe that that's maybe the preview we're, we're able to get with our, our current technological limitations well bolivia is a beautiful country i think it's um one of two landlocked countries in South America, as I recall. La Paz, for those who haven't been very, you know, the elevation is stunning. And uh, outside of La Paz is Tiahuacu, uh, which is an ancient ruin. Those of you who've read Chariots of the Gods and all of that spin, that's part of, that was part of the thesis. I don't think, I don't know if I subscribe to that book, but it's an interesting place to visit. I actually wrote an article for uh, a travel publication many years ago when I visited on that visit. Um, but in terms of space travel and modern, you know, what's real, uh, French Guiana, to go to French Guiana, oh, yeah. uh, which, which which is home to the European space effort in terms of launching. Mm -hmm. And the reason it's there is physics. Uh, the reason Cape Canaveral is in Florida is physics. The closer we are to the equator, uh, the less thrust it takes to get a projectile into space uh, because of the the... the uh, gravitational forces and the centripetal forces. Uh, so y Europe, France, uh, loca located their launch facility uh, in French Guiana, uh, which I had an opportunity to visit. Uh, I could have stayed to watch a launch, but I don't know if I could have returned home in time, so I missed it. And it's very close to yeah. Devil's Island. So yeah. we all heard about Devil's Island. And, and what and what's surreal, you're in the middle of a, those of you who've been to South America, a very... Um, beautiful country, uh, but very basic in many ways. So you're in the middle of a jungle in, in many respects, uh, but in the middle of the jungle is this state-of-the-art space age launching facility, kind of like Cape. Mm. Uh, the juxtaposition I thought was was very cool. Um, and, and those of you who haven't been to Devil's Island, um, you know the movie Papillon, uh, that's, that's worth a visit too. Now, I, I went to French Guy, but I did not go to Devil's Island. So tell us about that experience. Well, it's the beauty of the island belies its um, very disturbing history. Uh, the, uh, the, 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 the brutality of even if the worst of the worst convicts um, uh, that, that were subjected to life on this on this tropical isle. Uh, it's gut wrenching. The stories I heard, and th this is modern, relatively modern Europe. Uh, who would, uh, and it's all relative to history and time and context. Uh, but it, uh, that's where the worst of the worst uh, were were sentenced uh, from France, um, and the conditions were were meager um, and in 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 very uh, very challenging. I mean, if you put yourself in someone's shoes who actually was sent to Devil's Island. Um, the water, the water's between the shore and Devil's Island. It's a bit of a bit of a boat ride. I think I took a kayak out out there. Uh, I'm told a, a shark laden, even though we swam in the water. Um, <laughs> but the island itself is, I mean, the island itself is absolutely gorgeous. It's, it's something you would, uh, from a distance, but when you when you walk the island, you see the old prison cells in the in the guard tower, and the this is common bath area where convicts, I think, were allowed to bathe once a month. Uh, essentially, seawater that was dammed up. Um, uh, it, it brings back the the reality of the history of the place. Mm, wow, that's incredible. And I, anytime I have a discussion with a traveler like yourself, I end up with regrets of I went there but didn't go there. All of those uh, those moments, so I'll have to go back. It is. It's a good thing. It's you're something. Young man. It's it, it's a 
for many people, it could be surprising. It's you, you've got you not Spanish speaking, not Portuguese speaking, and, and yet you're in South America and here it's French, here it's Dutch. I mean, it, it's uh, it's uh, so it's such a, a, a geopolitical quirk that just going to every country is is what what gotten me in these these kind of spots. Well, as you know, technically French Guiana is not a country. It's it's a no? it, it belongs to France. Uh, and the domestic flight to Paris. That's right. That's right. It, it, it belong, it's it's part of France. And when you cross the border, you have an EU stamp, and the currency is, is euro. That's so, right. It's what or is there four or five dependents depart overseas departments, right? That's the I think that's the distinction. So they're truly they're departments. They're not. There's like there's other levels, right? There's collectives and this and that that are not not full on domestic France legally, but it's what uh, French Guiana, Reunion, is it what Guadeloupe and Martinique? I forget the uh, the ones That's, I think that, that are. Uh, and Guadeloupe and Martinique are both worth a visit as well. I found logistically it's challenging to get flights uh, without making a, a ton of connections. Yeah, for a while, I, I mean, I'm, I don't know if they'll ever come back. For a while, Norwegian was flying from what Boston and JFK that uh, made those very easy, but they had trouble selling the tickets. It was frequently $99. But before that, it was uh, how many times you can connect on AA to get to, to get to these. And it is almost easier to go back through Paris to, to, to visit them. But if you Google flights to, to French Guiana, um, they're direct flights from Paris, but getting there from the US is, it, trust me, it's a challenge. Yeah, I went I went overland and then over the across the river from Suriname because uh, Suriname had more more flight availability when I, uh, to get back to the Caribbean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. From Paramaribo. Yeah. Fantastic. Now we've got a lot of foodies in the group, and we we haven't really touched on food, but I keep hearing about Fairfax, Virginia. Uh, the DC scene is supposed to be great uh, for high end dining and, and all kinds of eats, but a lot of the ethnic dining is seems like the action, the, the buzz is in places like Fairfax. So tell us about a foodie trip to your region. So to, to Washington, D.C. and greater Washington, D.C. in general, meaning uh, suburban Maryland and Virginia surrounding D.C., uh, it's, as I mentioned earlier, it is uh, multicultural, extremely diverse, and people come from all over the world to live here, obviously, because of the nation's capital and a lot end up staying. Um, as a result, you have a diversity of food experiences around DC. Uh, I think second to none that I've seen in the US, uh, neck, and, you know, neck and neck with Flushing uh, in, in a very livable environment. Uh, Fairfax County, Virginia, which is again, right outside of DC, uh, the high school system I'm told has children speaking 70 to 90 different languages collectively. So that that's one indicia of how, how diverse this region is. And, and, and that begets um, cultural experiences, including restaurants and, and different so-called ethnic food uh, opportunities here in DC. So if you're a foodie, um, it's a great, great destination if, that, if that's something you're interested in. If, um, uh, if you're a hipster, uh, I think, believe it or not, DC was ranked number one hipster town in <laughs> a year or two ago. And jar drinks per capita than any place in the world. <laughs> There's, there's an area called H Street uh, Corridor, which is, if those of you in Washington, it's near the U.S. Capitol building itself um, uh, behind our train station, which is called Union Station. And unfortunately, it was a scene of, of, of riots back in the 70s, has totally been re, uh, repurposed. And, and although still retains that sort of edgy feel that you might feel, say, in the East Village in New York, mm -hmm. uh, but many, many, many uh, ethnic uh, and so-called hipster uh, restaurants and hangouts. And uh, not that I'm crossing a across, hmm? not that I'm exactly a hipster, but yeah, <laughs> we, we can all dream. We can all pretend. Actually, our interview subject tomorrow is is ultra hipster uh, Portland foodie guy who uh, goes between move moved to Portland from Austin, another hipster place. So uh, that's a teaser for tomorrow. Uh, for the group, but uh, also not not hipster at all. But uh, you've you've studied at Georgetown, Harvard, and one that that really popped out. I'm curious because they 
they have summer programs that that you can spend a few weeks taking a course at Oxford. What what is that Oxford experience like? Is it is it really like the Harry Potter scenes and, and that that worthwhile to, to try to get any shape or form? Well, whether or not you study at Oxford, it's worth a visit. I mean, it's such a beautiful city, rich in history. Um, they have they have pro, I'm sure they have programs of all kinds. Uh, I always wanted to uh, have the Oxford experience. Um, and it was one of my goals, which I thankfully achieved that it was, a, it was, I'd do it all over again. It's so worthwhile. Uh, the, the university is steeped in history. Uh, we think of our major institutions as being old and fabled. Oxford has over 800 years uh, of, of education uh, creds at, at, at its disposal and layer upon layer of history that dates back to you know, medieval times and before, and the, the college system at Oxford is is unique. It's very different from the West, uh, but I love my time there. It is Harry Potter-esque. Uh, mm -hmm. my, daughter, my daughter loved that. In fact, I think some of the scenes from certain movies were filmed in some of the halls uh, on, on Oxford cap, cam, uh, campus um, and, and, and uh, the Radcliffe camera, which is their big domed library that you probably have, have seen photos of. It, it, so I, I loved it. I love, I'm a big proponent in lifelong education. I think it goes hand in hand with our desire to travel and learn and experience new things. Uh, one of the, from, from, a, from a Western, from a U.S. Uh, perspective, probably one of the quirkier things was uh, adhering to all the traditions at Oxford, one of which was uh, wearing a, a certain outfit when you would take an examination. We've seen Harry Potter and, and the, the little cape and the hat. Uh, mm -hmm. You wear a similar outfit when you take, we've all taken exams in high school and college and grad school. Um, imagine taking those exams, not in jeans and a t-shirt, but you're wearing a, what they call a sub fusk, which is their uh, kind of looks like a graduation outfit uh, with a mm -hmm. cape and, and a hat and, and, and a little tie. Oh, fantastic. Uh, do we have a, do we have a photo? A record of you of you doing that in your, your <laughs> sub fusk. <laughs> I have my graduation photo in a sub fusk, but not 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 in the exam room. Fantastic! I think I think lifelong learning is is a, a wonderful message to not not close on the pod. We'll, we'll end this conversation, but continue the learning and exchange. And uh, thank you for spending your evening with us, Jeff. Thank you. My pleasure. Good to be with you. Hope everyone remains safe and healthy. And uh, that this time passes quickly and we're all back to traveling. Thank you. Wonderfully said. Good night, everyone. Good night.